We're holding this program in conjunction with Dumbo Open Studios. Over 100 artists are participating in the month-long event, joined by Dumbo's artists in residence programs and galleries. Events continue throughout July, so for more information, you can go to DumboOpenStudios.com. They have a lot going on uh, the whole month of July. Smack Mellon's Artist Studio Program provides six artists each year with a private studio, a fellowship, access to a fabrication shop and media lab, two open studios events each year, and private studio visits from curators, critics, and gallerists. If you're, if, please mute yourself, okay? The application for our 2021 Artist Studio Program will be available in the fall, so please check the Opportunities section of our website in September, October. We're not sure when it will go live, but around uh, mid-September to mid-October for the application link. I would like to dedicate this artist talk to Jane Walentis. Jane passed away on July 5th. Jane was a kind and generous person and a champion of the arts. Her support for artists and artists made it possible for so many to make and share their work with the public. Since 1998, Jane, her husband David, and son Jed have supported Smack Mellon and so many other arts organizations in Dumbo, the thriving neighborhood that they shaped where creativity is front and center. Jane was an artist and she understood the importance of making a place for artists to do so, she lent tremendous support to the people and institutions that allow artists to flourish and create. She reached thousands of artists and hundreds of thousands of people who visited nascent organizations like Smack Mellon and St. Anne's Warehouse in the early years, and many others that moved to Dumbo through her space subsidy program. Jane's legacy continues. Her support for artists does not end when they leave their Smack Mellon or Sharp Willenta studio or when they complete a world premiere run at St. Anne's. Having been given the chance to develop their work at an early stage of their career, these artists are given the momentum they need to continue to produce and show their work. Jane's investment in them is compounding, it's growing, and it's unstoppable. Thank you, Jane. And now I would like to introduce Becky Salinger, Smack Mellon Programs Manager. <laughs> thank you so much for that introduction, Kathleen, um, and thank you everybody for being here. We have seven artists presenting this evening. Each artist will show their work for five minutes, followed by five minutes of questions and answers. If you have a question, either put it in the chat and we will read it, or write, I have a question, in the chat, and I will call on you to read your question out loud. I would like to thank the artists who are presenting their work tonight. We're going to start with Camel Collective and the rest of the lineup in, will, in the following order will be Rochelle Dang, Jess Fan, Camel Collective, Stephanie Hermosen, Gina Goico, and Javier Maria. Um, and just a simple reminder to please keep yourselves on mute throughout the presentations. I'm now going to share my screen. While I have my screen shared, your chat window might not be visible. To open the chat window, move your cursor to the bottom of the screen and click on chat. Our first artist is Camel Collective. Anthony Graves and collaborator Carla Herrera Prats, who passed away in 2019, worked together as Camel Collective since 2005, uh, since 2010. Camel Collective formed in 2005 as a research group at the Whitney Independent Study Program, conducting research on labor, the politics of affect, and the history of artist collectives. Camel Collective has exhibited and performed at museums and galleries, including WAC, Red Cat Gallery, Triennial de Artes Fresdas, the Bard Hessel Museum, Ulterior Gallery, Black Ball Projects, Artist Space, Art in General, Exit Art, and the Sala de Arte Publico. Anthony, are you ready? Just unmute myself. Can you hear me okay? 
Yep. Ah, great. Anybody remember exit art? That was great. <laughs> um, okay, so, uh, so I understand I have five minutes. So what I'll do, uh, I'm going to uh, read a text um, that I, I think presents a kind of not only content and thematics of what uh, my collaborator Carla and I um, sort of built over the last decade, um, but also the way in which we did it. Um, so I'll start. Um, so this first image, the still from the Second World Congress of Free Artists, it's a performance, Mexico City 2013. Most physical work begins by gripping tools, levers, or other devices, and then putting them into motion. The way the human hand grips a tool and the movements to which it gives rise are mutually dependent. Slide, please. A purposeful grip facilitates a string of movements. A pointless grip only obstructs potential motion. Slide, please. The title is 3439C, 3955C, Enamel Dye Steel and UV Print on MDF 2018. Releasing or setting aside an object is similarly dependent upon previous kinds of movement. The same goes for when a movement involves zooming in on an object. Slide, please. Or say, operating a control panel. In such manual activities, uh, slide. As seamless as possible, cast lead steel 2018. The hand's task is not only to hold something, it must also function simultaneously as an organ of perception. The pressure required for operating knobs, buttons, switches on a control panel must be dispensed in just the right way so that corresponding sensitivity in the hand is still possible. Slide. Such that the artifice is maintained, cast lead and steel 2018. The dependence of a grip on factors such as necessary grip pressure, the possibility for perception, the kind of objects to be grasped, and the movement to be performed produces such a variety of possible types of grips that a classification capable of doing justice to all of the many variations is hardly possible. Slide. This is a video still from the distance from Pontresina to Zermatt is the same as from Zermatt to Pontresina, two channel video, six channel sound, 26 minutes, 2017. The wide grip allows for the greatest holding power However, it permits movement only in the wrist, elbow, and shoulder. All of the more refined grips result from especially versatile and variable pinch grip, which allows for the finest play of movement. Slide. Still from La Distancia. Of all the characteristics responsible for unifying the muscles and nerves, the brain, as well as the skin associatively with one another, or in other words, for the human body's feedback systems, its so-called rear view mirror, the ability to distinguish between when to use a power grip and a precision grip is the most significant evolutionary achievement. Slide. Again, a still from La Distancia. It's the foundation of our ability to maneuver ourselves, an ability that is most easily disrupted by external forces. These forces are also capable of disturbing our self-regulation. Slide. This is Justice Actor, something other than what you are. Dye sublimation print on acrylic in MDF, 2017. When measured against an external violence, internal cunning appears by its very nature to be something lacking in violence. When I act in a cunning manner, I refuse to attack things frontally and instead try to bring the inner power relations of objects into motion for myself. Slide. This is called Justice Technician from La Distancia. 2017. In actuality, cunning behavior is tied to the powers of the opponent so that it leads to a reversal of their direction until the point in time when they revert to their opposite. These powers are steered towards a place they inher inherently do not wish to inhabit. This reversal is violent as well. Slide. Index for Carla, HD video, nine minutes, 2020. I'm interested in feelings that are not immediately recognized as feelings, that are integrated into institutions, and that first manifest themselves only in an emergency, at the moments when we forget ourselves. Slide. A mother rescues her child, who is lying in front of a tractor. She pushes it out of the way, and she dies herself. That is a short reflex arc, one that cannot actually be achieved through calculation. That is feeling. But this feeling has nothing to do with sentiment slide. 
with the feelings that we know from theater, for example. It has more to do with the feelings in my fingertips that I use to secure a gasket at the right moment. It is actually a matter of labor. Slide. Until the grasp of the word, the infant's meaning resides only within the mother's psyche soma, within her body. With the word, the infant has profound, a profound and new transformational object, which facilitates the transition from deep enigmatic privacy towards the culture of the human village. And I think that's our last slide. Great, thank you so much, Anthony. I hope I was on time. You were definitely on time. That was great. Um, oh, good. So does anyone have any questions or comments for Anthony? Hmm. I realize it's a lot to take in and that is that is part of and parcel of our work. <laughs> There's usually a silence afterwards. <laughs> Um, so just for okay. as Audrey put in the chat that if you'd like to ask a question, add it to the chat or um, just say, I have a question in the chat. Hmm. Gabriel de hmm. Guzman has a question. Yeah. Okay. Gabriel. Okay. Hi. <laughs> Hey, Gabriel. Uh, um, can you talk a little bit about the nature of collaboration um, mm -hmm. in Camel Collective? And I know it started as a larger group that came out of um, a group of you that were working together at the Whitney Independent Study Program. And then you and Carla sort of continued Camel Collective on your own, the two of you, but then you, you've brought in other um, other collaborators along the way and for different projects. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Sure, that's a, yeah, that's a really good question and a really important, the central question for us for a really long time. Um, before, I, before I do, I just wanted to thank Kathleen, Becky, Gabriel, everybody at Smack Mellon, because I, I think I just jumped into the text. I was worried about time, but thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to talk. Um, so, um, yeah, so Carla and I, I mean, our, our ideas about collaboration and collectivity uh, changed over the course of working together for 15 years, um, certainly. And um, I think in the beginning, we, we were much more idealistic coming out of the Whitney ISP. We thought that the name Camel Collectives could sort of function as this signifier under which any collaboration could occur. Um, so we saw it as kind of more free floating. And at that point, there were, um, we were having weekly meetings in this kind of research group thinking about the history of collaboration and collectivity uh, in and around particularly New York in the 70s and 80s, um, and looking very particularly at groups like uh, Pad D, like Greg Chalette, um, and the work of Lucy Lepard. Uh, also, group materials were very important to us. Um, and once we started, uh, for many different reasons, mostly for um, kind of uh, people's careers sort of went in a direction or people went back to their home country after the Whitney ISP, we sort of narrowed down into a smaller, uh, I think, more coherent group. Um, and that's when we started working collectively to produce not an archive or conversations, but more artworks. And that's when it really started to become like me, Carla Lassa, um, and this other artist, uh, filmmaker, Benj Gerdes. Um, and that's when we, I think, the this I we began to differentiate between collaboration and collectivity. And so Carla and I working together, it became very clear for us that like, that Carla and I are a, a collective, even if it's a collective of two. And we like to keep that sort of fiction of the collective, um, also because we sound bigger than we are. And so we could sort of, you know, we could perform a certain kind of institutionality, right? <laughs> um, and which, which has a certain mode of address. Um, so when you hear Camel Collective, you think, oh, there's 15 people, that's actually two. Um, but, uh, but the real distinction there is, is um, that we would collaborate with people, but they weren't necessarily part of the collective. And I think that's about maintaining a kind of boundary so that, um, you know, Carla and I really share a certain fate. Um, we share the risk in the work. We share the authorship of the work. Uh, we share its, its failure and our collaborators that gets into much more questions about labor working together. I mean, you could say um, even that um, uh, 
you know, people who work at Google collaborate. It's sort of like a buzzword, kind of a, a buzzword in the business world. And so that, that was a way to sort of distinguish the way in which collaboration was, was occupied and valorized by the business world, by capital, but collectivity still retained a certain um, kind of political horizon for us, if that makes sense. Thank you, that, that, that's great, thank you. Okay, and I think we have time for one more question. So we'll go to uh, April Zan Johnson. Mm -hmm. April, yes. Okay, um, I, I'd love to, uh, anyway, he's fascinating. Um, I love hearing about this. And I'm curious to, if you could elaborate a little bit more on the, um, the unmeasurable moments where mm. the mother uh, threw herself down as an instinctual, uh, you know, act. That's, I'm a mother myself, I have four children, and I, I totally can relate mm. with that. So <laughs> I'm, I'm curious to know a little bit more um, about that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I like that question in part because it gets to a, a, a something in the text. Um, so this text is a, um, a series of quotes from other texts. And one of, and the quote that you're focusing on um, is from Alexander Kluge uh, in a book called History and Obstinacy. And the reason I chose that was because it led into the next quote, which was by uh, Christopher Bolas, uh, who's a psychoanalyst uh, from the British Independent School of Psychoanalysis. And, um, and he wrote a really fascinating text um, in which he claimed, um, and I sort of follow him here, that the first aesthetic experience that a human can have is, is as an infant with the mother. And so there's an experience of a kind of pre-verbal, pre-language affect. And so I think that quote that you're zeroing in on with um, the mother who risks her life and dies because of her child, not out of a kind of um, emotion, but out of a feeling. And, I think that I think what's important for me about that is to be able to distinguish affect from emotion. So emotion might be something that an actor can sort of portray and emotions have a certain like culturally coded significance, right? Like, like yeah. I feel sad or something, but right. an affect, an, an affect is in the body and it's, it's unconscious and it's unknown until an you can reflect on it. Yeah. It, it could be like an instinct or, um, uh, and so I think there's a, an aspect of um, a kind of um, unthought relationship to an object there, which when we encounter a work, there's a kind of, there's a demand upon the, uh, that the object has upon us to sort of give it a moment in which the, the relationship between yourself and the object is an unthought moment. And I think that that, there's a kind of, you know, I'll say, Maybe this is controversial or something, and I don't mean it to be uh, reductive. But I, but um, I'm really interested in in this um, the way in which the relationship between an art object and a viewer uh, in an encounter can kind of function in a similar way to an infant and a mother relation, mm -hmm. in which the, there's a kind of nonverbal being together before there's a thinking together, and that, mm -hmm. or that the object the object also thinks for the Absolutely. the object, aka the mother thinks for the child. It's a, absolutely. A yeah. So I think objects can metabolize. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. All right. Thank you. Ah, sorry. <laughs> On to the, the next artist, but thank you so much, Anthony. Okay. This conversation yeah. is fascinating and okay. certainly go on forever. All right, right, right. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. Great. Our next artist is uh, Rochelle Dang. Rochelle Dang is a sculptor whose work engages with the complexities of colonial legacies. Currently based in Brooklyn, she has exhibited her work in New York at Socrates Sculpture Park, Fergus McCaffrey, Natalie Carr Gallery, Leslie Heller Gallery, Botel, and MH Project NYC. Additional exhibitions include the Honolulu Museum of Art, Hawaii Pacific University, and the Haverford College Art Galleries. Her residencies and fellowships include Smack Mellon, Shandaken Storm King Art Center, Cooper Union, Sculpture Space, AIR Gallery, and Yado in 2021. Dang received an MFA in sculpture from Hunter College in 2018. Rochelle, are you ready? Yeah. 
Rashad, I think you're still on mute. How's this? Yep, we can hear you now. That's great. Thank you. Um, my deep thanks to Smack Mellon for the opportunity to be part of this wonderful residency program. Um, I'm from Hawaii and for a long time my work has focused on Pacific colonial histories. My process involves reconstructing and transforming objects from the past to respond to colonial and ecological legacies in the present. I will speak about the historical references in several works. And next slide, please. This installation, Southern Oceans, featured two reconstructions of an 18th century botanical transport container designed to move living breadfruit tree saplings from Tahiti to England for observation and eventual cultivation in the Caribbean. I was struck by the cage or prison-like appearance of the structure in the original scientific drawing on the left and built my forms by referencing this image. Next slide, please. Uh, 275 ceramic breadfruit sculptures appear to be rotting on the gallery floor. On the wall is my fragmented digital recreation of a panoramic colonial wallpaper from 1805 depicting imagined scenes of the Pacific and artificial representations of indigenous Pacific Islanders. Through my research, I learned about early climate catastrophe in the Caribbean due to deforestation and monocropping sugar, which threatened famine and profits from slavery. Living breadfruit, uh, living breadfruit trees indigenous to the Pacific were to be transported by the hundreds from Tahiti to Jamaica and St. Vincent. Um, in Hawaii, ecological devastation occurred similarly through cash crop or agriculture. This insulation raises questions of control over environments and people while challenging that through the generative potential of the fruits and expression of creative agency. Next slide, please. This is my original proposal and historical reference for a project at Socrates Sculpture Park, recently deinstalled. I looked to other specialized cases for botanical science, such as this compartmentalized box used to transport seeds, pine cones, and other plant material from North America to Europe in the early 1700s. Next slide, please. Titled Seed Box, Trees of New York, it resembled a giant treasure box like a Joseph Cornell work containing jumbo hand-built seed sculptures, five trees native to the New York region, and straps with botanical prints from the same era. The work responds to networks of seed exchange, colonial trade routes, global commerce, and a search for knowledge. Next slide, please. One aim of this project was to provide a new context for the seed box today. The keyhole raised questions of value. Who values the contents of this box and for what ends? Given the context of the park and the children who visit, I wanted to encourage a sense of wonder and curiosity, inspiring the protection of nature. I created the design, digital prints, and worked on the seed sculptures in my studio at Smack Mellon, and the rest was built on site at Socrates. Next slide, please. This sculpture has a poetic and psychological emphasis. Its form also comes from early botanical carriers designed for moving tropical plants from the Pacific to Europe and between colonial territories. I wanted to respond to the strange familiarity of the structure, which resembles a dollhouse, crib, sarcophagus, or birdcage, elevated like a house protected from a flood and constructed from airy diamond mesh. The form relates to loss, displacement, rebirth, and uncertain journeys. Next slide, please. This work I developed and created at Smack Mellon last fall. Resembling a trunk or a small house with a gable roof, the structure was surrounded by worn and misshapen cushions, hand-built in clay, resembling sandbags. These cushions, once supple markers of comfort and safety, are rendered rigid, their parched and cracked surfaces attest to strain and desiccation. Next slide, please. These are the French and British versions of botanical transport containers I have referenced in my work, which predate the better known Wardian glass cases by 50 years. Crates never went empty on a ship. So en route from Europe to the Pacific, they carried other plants Europeans felt useful for distributing in the Pacific a kind of botanical civilizing mission that altered native ecologies. Last slide, please. 
Um, I try to articulate interwoven vulnerabilities of nature, body, and material. The handmade vines and leaves appear rigid and desiccated as bones or acidified coral. The child's sleeping bag evokes preciousness and a sense of loss. No longer soft, it has been remade as a brittle, fragile object. Difficult to see, but on the fence, these human ears mysteriously sprout from the flowers like protective watchers or empathetic witnesses. Um, thank you uh, for this residency and thanks everyone for being here. Thanks so much, Rochelle. Thank you. Um, so again, if you have questions, put them in the chat. April says, what are the white, white vines made from? I use a children's paper clay. Uh, it's, it was developed for schools without specialized ceramics facilities. So upon leaving my MFA program, I lost my, my ceramics facilities. So it gave me new opportunities to use this clay because um, within this entire, within all the vines are wires, um, they're all adhered to the fence and I, can, I could work in a very delicate, fragile way. And the air dry clay is more robust than say porcelain, but it still has a feeling of porcelain because from a distance you can't tell one from the other. The, the pods are very interesting at the, on the lower uh, portion of the photograph. Um, they almost have this metamorphosis feeling, um, that, like a cocoon, uh, like birth, uh, create, creation. Mm, that's wonderful. That's exactly what I wanted. They're like, the seed pods are like little uteruses and they're protective carriers, just like the sleeping bag or the botanical cages are carriers. The seed pod is a carrier itself and it releases the seeds on their parachutes. Like the mother re releases the child in the, you know, to preschool and gives the child a sleeping bag. <laughs> you know, or things make a journey for different reasons across the world. So it, I'm glad it has that um, association, also the generative potential. That even if the work starts from a kind of place that's maybe has a difficult history, it transforms to something um, generative and redemptive. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, and then Anthony has a question. Let me get myself. Hey, um, thanks for the presentation. I there's I have a question that I because I, I've been I sort of know your work and I've seen it in the studios and I was wondering if you could talk a bit about the these carriers the these like historical containers that seem to also the, you're sort of reproducing them but also um, I'm curious how the works as art travel as well because um, you know our, particularly the fragility of your sculptures is kind of like the fragility of uh, or I see similarities to the fragility of the, um, the botanical samples and you know there's so much care put into art creating and things like that I wonder if you could talk about um, that kind of relationship of transit and um, if that makes sense yeah oh yeah there's a very embarrassing moment when they are incomplete, but they get made. I, sometimes I ask for help from carpenters or a welder. And so it's like I'm moving cages in U-Haul trucks often with the help from friends. And um, I, I move the work myself. And I, because of the size of my work, I, I remain local to New York City. I try to only, I try my best to uh, show here unless there's a budget that can allow for, you know, uh, the, the long, the longer distance transfer. I don't create, I have not created the work out of my own cost. Um, I just wrote to a curator and she, she complimented me on being like a registrar because I went into detail on how it goes in a, in a truck and, uh, um, exposed, but cushioned on foam with belts and cushions, but they, um, yeah, they're strange little crates like we know from art but the size of my work keeps me here in New York, which I really appreciate. So my friends and my community sees my work. Um, people see my work um, again over time. And I feel that is one way to kind of um, be here on the Atlantic and kind of stretch to Hawaii, stretch to different parts of the world, but be in this central place. Mm. Um, yeah, it is costly to move this sculpture, these kinds of sculptures and the Socrates work no longer exists. It had to be taken apart mm. and dismantled. Oh, thanks. 
Um, great, thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Rochelle. And now we're going to be moving on to our next artist, which is Jess Fan. Um, before we get started with Jess, there is a, if, a question about asking questions um, that I wanna answer. Um, so if you wanna send a question publicly, because some people are stuck on private, you click on the blue box in your chat, right above where it says type your message here and click on it. And that's, and you can click on everyone. Um, so hopefully that, that clarifies things. Okay. So as I said, our next artist is Jess Fan. Jess Fan was born in Canada, raised in Hong Kong, and now lives and works in Brooklyn. Fan received his BFA in glass from Rhode Island School of Design and works with glass, silicone, and resin to create sculptures that question binary conceptions of race, gender, and identity. Fan is exhibited at museums and galleries, including Biennale of Sydney, Socrates Sculpture Park, and the Times Museum. Fan is a recipient of many awards, such as the Jerome Hill Fellowship, Joan Mitchell Foundation Painters and Sculptors Grant, and the New York Community Trust Van Leer Fellowship. Fan is the subject of an Art 21 New York close-up film, Just Fan, Infectious Beauty. The full film showing the artist in his Smack Mellon studio is available to watch online. Jess, are you ready? Hi, everyone. Um, I want to thank Smack Mellon um, for giving me this platform to share my work and also the opportunity to be a resident at the space for this past year. Um, can we go on to the next slide, Becky? So um, this is a sample of the forms that usually hang off my sculpture or fix into undulations um, of the larger sculpture. And um, usually, my my sculpt my my sculptural practice like spe speculates on the fraught intersection between biology and identity, and are often guided by three main lines of questioning: How is it made? What is it made out of? Who is it made for? In my projects, I use these lines of questioning to navigate complex mechanism of othering, such as how is my gender made? How is Chineseness engendered? What is queerness, or what can queerness be without desiring? For example, in 2017, I did a project called Mother's a Woman where I extracted estrogen from my mother's urine and created a beauty cream out of it. Then I distributed the cream to folks outside of my biological kin, proposing questions such as, if you're feminized by my mother, who are you to her and who am I to you? Um, and in 2018, I worked on a project called Xenophoria during my residency at Recess Art, which I'll dive into a little later. I worked with a bio lab in Brooklyn to extract eumelanin from E. coli. The specificity of using E. coli as a host is deliberate um, as a way to highlight the parallels between fears of miscegenation and contamination, which especially rings true during the age of COVID. So recently I started incorporating these contested substances in my sculptural work, um, sim similar to what this image is showing. Um, mostly like um, uh, these elements such as, such as um, testosterone, estrogen, or urine um, are injected inside biomorphic glass globs. Um, and next slide, please. So um, during my residency at Smack Mellon, I spent the majority of my time working on my presentation for the Biennale of Sydney. These works were debuted at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Sydney right before COVID became a pandemic. Um, and now I think the museum is reopened and it's on view until July, 2020. So next slide, please. In the gallery, there are two large sculptures titled Form Begets Function and Function Begets Form. They're kind of like shelf-like sculptures that are inspired by classical Chinese scholar shelves as well as scientific diagrams of the dermal layer of the skin. Next slide. In the back of the gallery is a new single channel video titled Xenophoria. Um, I'm not gonna show the video today, but because there's, I just think Zoom is such a weird format to show any kind of media work. Um, and as opposed to the term, more the more well-known term is xenophobia, the word xenophoria kind of um, 
pushes at this idea of the love of the foreign as, as, and, and not the fear of the foreign. And it's actually inspired by the name of a mysterious aquatic carrier shell called Sinophora palata. This shell calcifies itself around free floating objects in the water and, are, and is actually called the artist shell um, when you go to the Natural History Museum. And um, this video, Xenophoria, takes its name from its shell and stages this delirious search for the melanin pigment in the lab and also in the body, but not just like the anthropomorphic body, but also its sites of um, like such as squids, um, such that as mold and fungi. Next slide. So a smooth surface of the sculpture is actually disrupted by blobs of hand-blown glass pumped with an array of biological substances such as, as blood, semen, melanin, and sex hormones. Next slide. Created by curves and dips within the shells, these globs appear to grow up from their surfaces like pearls from the flesh of an oyster, instantiating a perverse fusion between the display service and object, viewer and viewed. Next slide. So, the thin veil of glass allowed the viewers to witness the decay of these bodily liquids, conjuring this abject fear of contamination infection in contrast with the formless appearance of the shells. So these um, glass forms are just actually balanced on these vertical and kind of hanging off of the hypercarious. Um, next slide. I'm interested in borrowing the vernacular of furniture, as I often think of furniture as sculptures for the function of the body. I'm also interested in, in using that kind of reference to challenge the arbitrary hierarchies, hierarchies between art, craft, and design. Why is one considered more pedestrian or more feminine than the other? Next slide. So these, this one has my blood in it, and um, the, these glass gloves are designed to actually like to be removed from the shell and inspected and held against the skin. Next slide. I'm interested in navigating touching as a way of knowing, because to touch is also to be touched, and it's been a long time since we all touched each other. <laughs> and in the next slide, in next slide, please. So this one has, uh, oh, sorry, go back. Yeah, so this one actually has a pharmaceutical um, testosterone in it. In the next slide. So in this kind of gesture of allowing the container to be removed from the shelf, I think about how um, objects are cradled, especially referencing how classical Chinese craft objects are displayed, often cradled by an intricately carved wooden base that attends the bottom of a sculpture, which I think it's kind of funny. Um, like no kind of Greco-Roman tradition, like you, know, you go to the Met and you see them, the contrapposto of the form actually grafted to this ambiguous log of wood. But in, in doing this, like thinking about how to invite variation of senses to, to act in the way of knowing and understanding a um, piece of art um, became a challenge to me and also definitely a challenge to the museum and its insurance policy. So, um, yeah, I think I'm at time. Am I correct? You are at time. All right. Okay, thank you. We have a question from April and then a comment from Judith. So April, let's start with you. Hey, uh, that's, they're amazing. Um, I'm, I'm really fascinated with the idea that you've created these objects uh, to be touched. Are they all touchable sculptures? And uh, they're very ethereal. And Sorry, I think you broke up a little bit. Uh, are, are, the, are the sculptures all meant to be uh, touched? Is that part of the way that you intend the viewer to interact with them? They're beautiful. Um, not, not all of my sculptures in a way, but um, I definitely intend them to be touched and held um, and experienced that way. But um, the issue is the touch nowadays, it's, I mean, we, the way we associate, or like what Anthony says in his talk too, there's so many variation of touch. Like I, we ultimately arrived on this um, uh, kind of truce between the museum and I, where the, there'd be a, um, 
like uh what do you call that person a conservationist yeah Mm -hmm. Uh, doing like special open kind of uh, hours for people to hold the objects versus like having people just approach the sculpture and touch them all the time because it also needs to be um like a very careful like full of care kind of touch and not just you know like this object (laughs) that we're looking at the screen right now is you know the holder indicates its precarity and also preciousness um, yeah so they have a feeling of uh of, of almost like a an embodiment of love to them and uh, oh, thank thanks you. i'll tell thank my you. therapist about it <laughs> <laughs> thank you for answering the question <laughs> okay um let's go to judith okay well uh, it's sort of comment and question i love them i think they're fabulous Um, They also, there's certain parts that remind me of surrealism, of Giacometti, um, you know, there are a lot of influences in there, but you come from a completely other intellectual uh, direction. And I wanted to know if these were people that you like, that you, uh, you know, that that as the aesthetic of somebody like a Giacometti or a or a, or a surrealist uh, has had any impact on you because they're they're not just intellectual they're quite visual and as you say tactile and I, I can I can relate to that I actually just did a, a drawing called the touch enigma which is all about that you know fingers have nowhere to go um, anyhow um, th- that would be the question yeah um... I'm really suspicious of um, icons and especially what we consider like canons of a specific movement because usually they're a really specific kind of demographic. So I don't really know too much. I mean, I know who Giacometti is, but then I also am interested in other kind of surrealist artists, which is like Jacqueline Lamba, but also like who's married to Andre Breton, but also I'm I'm more interested in kind of challenge, like, yeah, I'm also interested in a lot of crafts folks and also um, like, I think I'm not just interested in Western canons. But I mean, yeah. So okay. um, I think I draw a lot of references from um, Noguchi also. I think he's a really important person in my art practice that I think Actually, often about. I think the last um, slide has a lot of Asian influence. Uh, I can't help but think of references since we're doing art. It's something I've studied my whole life and love and, uh, mm. but they're, they're really nice. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, so we are going to move on to Chantal Feitosa. Chantal Feitosa is a Brazilian American artist from Queens, New York. Her process shifts between new media, collage, and social practice to address themes of racial bias, beauty standards, and belonging. Her video work has been selected for multiple film festivals across the country, including Harlem International Film Festival, the Every Woman Biennial, and the Anti-Racist Classrooms Represent Film Festival. She had been awarded residencies at the Anderson Ranch Art Center and Residency Unlimited, and is a 2020 Real Art award recipient. Chantal received her BFA in film animation video from the Rhode Island School of Design and she is an alumna of the Studio Museum and Harlem's Museum Education Practicum. Chantal Feitosa is one of SmackMellon's 2019-2020 New York Community Trust Van Leer Fellows. Chantal, are you ready? Yes, can you hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you great. Thank you, Becky, for the introduction, and thank you so much to Smack Mellon for the opportunity of this residency over the past year. For starters, I'd like to state that I speak directly from the position of a light-skinned Black biracial woman, and I don't think I can give the presentation I'm about to without acknowledging how the ambiguous body grants certain platforms and visibility, especially in spaces of cultural production that are predominantly white or rooted in class structures and especially through platforms as unique as Smack Mellon. This positioning informs my practice, which is encompassed by my work and interest in education. 
This practice exists between the two modes of art and knowledge production and how the experience of both can happen in tandem. This duality of production is guided by narratives of shape-shifting and diaspora. Next slide, please. The erasure of Blackness in the United States is driven by fear and repulsion. The erasure of Blackness in Brazil is disguised in the form of desire and consumption. We see these actions and feelings reflected in the images of our countries fabricated for public viewing. Next slide, please. We see this also in different record keeping systems that we've developed in the Americas when classifying each other. The erasure of blackness in the United States is enacted by the one drop rule and binary categories. The erasure of blackness in Brazil and the rest of Latin America is enacted through racial fluidity, whitening policies and forced assimilation. Next slide, please. Because language is taught to us from a very young age, most of my work focuses on imitating and appropriating the ways we learn and consume information during early childhood. I do this by recalling objects and lessons from my own childhood, but also in pulling from the performance of school and the dynamics of authority or submission that we learn to model in the classroom. Brown Bag Lunch is a project I started at Smack Mellon which plays on the American exclusionary practice of the brown paper bag test, determining which black people were entitled access to certain resources and spaces due to, due to the complexion of their skin during the 20th century. The words on the vocabulary cards are sourced from a 1976 national survey in Brazil, where respondents could racially self-identify with whatever terms they wanted. Several of the responses came back in the form of food. The erasure of blackness in the United States is driven by fear and repulsion. The erasure of blackness in Brazil is disguised in the form of desire and consumption. Next slide, please. When I work specifically with performance or a camera, I think about the gesture of collage and assembly and how these aesthetics relate to learning and displacement. When I replicate or satirize forms of pedagogy, such as literacy techniques, I try to contextualize the space of the classroom within certain narratives and histories of how miscegenation has been formed. The environment in which these frameworks for whiteness were shaped then become the site of how language is passed down from teacher to student, from friend to friend, from lover to lover, from mother to daughter. Next slide. Whether we use language or violence, whether we use language for violence or tenderness, is determined not only in the words we learn, but also the emotions and memory we attribute to them. In mid-June, I launched an online resource called the Black Wellness Guide, which provides an ongoing written framework for assessing and researching healing alternatives through a public Google Doc. The guide is comprised of both personal writing and an itemized menu for wellness resources, ranging from topics of food security to meditation, as well as crisis intervention toolkits and therapy databases. Final slide, please. The design of the project is inspired in part by the index pages of elementary school science textbooks, where students can be provided visual and verbal context to new information and, con and concepts they might encounter. As I've started to build out this project, I've been reflecting more on how education and knowledge production exist within larger ecosystems of care and social change. Self-preservation is a daily practice and developing the language around what works best for each of us takes time, accountability, practice, and peer support. I will include um, the most recent link of the wellness resource in the chat for those who are interested in utilizing it and circulating it. Thank you. Great, under time, thank you. <laughs> um, and thanks for sharing that, that link with everybody. Um, Roseanne has a question. Or Rosa, I'm not sure. Rosa, can you unmute yourself? Yes, I read the uh, your introduction online and looked at more of your work, and you had um, enlisting how you are investigating the trauma. You use new media collage and social practices to address critical. Uh, issues and racial bias. Could you just talk more about 
how you look at social practice or how you use social practice as an investiga investigatory and artistic approach? Yeah, so um, when I'm thinking about how um, education and art making exist together, I'm not, um, I have work similar to what I've done at Smack Mellon where it's done more privately in the studio and just me and a camera, but I also have um, iterations of more educational experiences where I am working with people and I am um, interested in replicating um, the way activities are conducted in a classroom and applying um, discussions of race and bias to them. So I've done, um, I've done um, like doll um, making and like role playing activities with preschoolers. Um, I've done projects where I recreate entire spelling bees in, uh, in auditoriums. Um, and those are usually more public facing and involve um, like more public interaction. But I like to alternate between um, these like educational games that are private and done with myself and then alternating between the ones that are more public. Thank you. That's pretty comprehensive. Um, I have a, oh, Anthony has a question. <laughs> Sorry, <clears throat> Becky, you should ask, you should ask. You go first and then I'll ask. Yeah, okay, okay. mine's uh, very quick. Oh, yeah. um, Chantal, I was, I, I was interested, you, you mentioned um, satire in relation to your work, and I forget if you said um, satire of pedagogy, um, but I wonder if you could talk more about satire as a dimension of your work. I'm really curious to hear about that. Yeah, I, I try to incorporate like some like, humor and sarcasm into my work. Um, and I think part of it also just comes from like the culture of Brazil. And I think like as a culture, we are a very, um, I, I think we like approach everything in a way that's like very dry and sarcastic, um, sometimes as coping mechanisms, but also just like as a larger part of how the culture communicates. Um, and I think for me, humor is also just a way of um, just like processing a lot of, um, these more like difficult, like intergenerational conversations of um, like how ideas of like racial trauma and like racial perception are passed down. Um, yeah, so a lot of it is like in part a, co a coping mechanism. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, my question was, I guess, a more pro process related. I was wondering if um you know what are what are some of the the challenges engaging with um you know people that you've never met or like just facing kind of the the unexpected um yeah it depends on the project i i personally really like the factor of like working with the unexpected and not really knowing um, like what the result of an interaction is going to be. Um, and when, when projects are activated in that way, I am also interested in how the participant also like has stakes in what is being made. Um, and I think like through that, then the work also kind of has a life um, of itself independent of me. Um, and in the past when I've done work that like involves children, there's also a lot of like prior conversations um, so when I've done like work with dolls and children, there was conversations of like talking to teachers of the classroom I was working with, as well as talking to parents and explaining the project. Um, and just like taking the necessary means involved to just like make sure that there is no like exploitation involved. Um, because I am interested in this idea of like co-authorship, especially when working with children and also like giving children a space to feel like where they have like power and agency. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you for answering that. Um, all right, thank you so much Chantal. We are going to move on to our next artist, um, Stephanie Hermosa.
Stephanie Mosen creates work that she calls Skins of Experience, Piel de Experiencia. Using extremely tactile materials, Hermosen communicates the urgency of remembering in conditions of displacement. Hermosen has exhibited at Zakaib and, and Sullivan Galleries, both in Chicago, Illinois, and at Jamaica Center for Arts and Learning in Queens, New York. She earned a BFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago in 2018, where she received multiple grants for her artistic merit. Stephanie Hermosen is one of Macmillan's 2019-2020 New York Community Trust Van Leer Fellows. Stephanie, are you ready to go? Yes. Thanks, Becky, for the intro. Um, and I want to thank Macmillan for having me and everyone here for joining. Um, so we can move on to the first slide. So I want to start off by saying that the majority of my work begins with uh, small and large format photographs I've taken of spaces that my family has occupied, recounting their journey uh, between Colombia, the Dominican Republic, and the United States. So using these spaces um, and the objects within them as inspiration, I've created, as Becky said, uh, the skins of experience or piel de experiencia. Next slide. So I use extremely tactile materials like latex, urethane, uh, to communicate the urgency of remembering in conditions of displacement. These objects are transformed into souvenirs that I use to recall the experiences of my Latin American identity. Next slide. So alongside these objects um, recreated from photo, uh, I've transformed items that have been passed down to me from different family members, like the blanket shown in this photo, uh, given to me by my grandmother, which I've cast in latex. Next slide, please. I've also collected uh, many of these objects over time, uh, like the cast of the, this leather Lazy Boy seat. I used its natural folds to embed the smaller images I've taken from contact sheets I've developed. Next slide. So the photos I've taken, developed, and collected over the years have in many ways found their place in my making and having informed our collections I'd once forgotten. Simple yet concrete moments like sitting in my grandmother's backyard as she watered her plants, sharing meals with strangers that I'd later find out were my second cousins, uh, watching a house be built from dirt, or swimming in a pool that belonged to someone I was related to. Next slide, please. Um, by shifting the emphasis from the material to the immaterial, I repurpose these objects from their enigmatic origin, giving disembodied memories physical form while retaining their tangential connection to notions of home. Next slide, please. So this is just a close up. We can go to the next slide. So this is a relatively new work. Uh, one of the things I began working on at Smackmallen, um, its assemblage is of a table leaf that I saved before being thrown out uh, with a faint iron mark, a yellow brick with Lottie Mar embedded into it, and a photo. Next slide, please. So Lottie Mar is a blue pectolite stone. It's found in, only in the Dominican Republic. And I placed it inside the yellow brick, uh, which is the color of the rich soil used to build homes there. Next slide. Um, it's dedicated to all the women in my life. I've grown up seeing wear Latimar through different fashions of jewelry, but more specifically my mother. Next slide, please. So this work, to go an older piece, it's sort of a culmination of living and experiencing uh, black and white ceramic tile beneath my feet, which I believe is kind of a low key standard in Latin American culture, standard for first floor living, especially the kitchen in comparison to vinyl and linoleum here. Next slide, please. So making this came from uh, a kind of frustration for where I was living at the time and wanting so badly to be somewhere in any capacity that reminded me of those spaces where I'd grown up um, walking barefoot on ceramic tile. 
Next slide. So this work and the next one um, kind of go hand in hand because I've been thinking a lot about my own proximity to the things I've been making. Um, this column is something I've lived with for about 20 years. Um, it's traveled around a bit and then ended up in my hands after the passing of my uncle. So it's something that felt necessary to make right now. Next slide, please. And so for my most recent work in progress, I've been kind of piecing together earlier objects that haven't found a final home in my practice, um, a postcard, a bar of soap, a seashell, two legs from my dining room table, all things I've uh, remade, recast. Um, so living so closely to them and spending so much time with these relic-like things as a result of the pandemic uh, has given me an extra sense of responsibility to preserve them and in doing so, preserving the memories within them. So yeah, that's my last slide. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Stephanie. Yeah. Um, Judith Ornstein has a question. Yes, um, it all seems so very personal. I was wondering how, what, how you see it as relating universally to everyone. Well, universally in, um, I guess the notion of memory is a broad thing, but um, having keepsake items that we all have those kinds of things that we've held on to for years or look at and they remind us of a certain memory. So in that sense, um, universal and yeah. Yeah, I think that, I mean, they all feel like they're like imbued with some amount of nostalgia, like even though I don't totally relate to some of the things like there's, um, I definitely feel some nostalgia look at looking at them. Um, who, uh, Rihanna, Rihanna has a question. Yeah, um, so I was curious, um, do you ever feel like sadness or like grief when you part with these objects that are so close to you and turn them into something else? Or do you feel like that's your way of like honoring the objects and honoring like where they came from? Um, that's a good question. I, uh, definitely relate to both. Um, definitely a sense of sadness because most of these objects I don't or the original things I don't have with me so my way of holding on to them is by remaking them and sort of living with them and having them with me all the time um, but also in the sense of honoring them with the sadness comes um, a sense of I guess, for lack of a better term, happiness that I'm recreating. It's, it's like a therapeutic thing I'm doing, um, holding on to these memories and or these moments that I find uh, special to myself. Yeah. Thank you for that question. And April has a question. Hey, um, thanks for sharing your work with us. Um, I actually do a lot of uh, work that has a similar, um, I guess, idea of collections and over lifetime um, pieces that are kind of enveloped into sculptural work. And I'm curious how um, you relate it to the greater uh, community or women in general. Um, thanks. Well, thank you. Um, I guess women in general, um, Specifically, I guess the, the piece where I'm talking about the women in my life. Um, so the table leaf was a leaf that my mother was throwing out with the iron mark that I hadn't even noticed was there. Um, and the Lottie Mar, which I, like I said, have seen all the women in my life wear through jewelry. And I thought it was such 
a special thing. I don't make jewelry, obviously, but the closest thing to that was uh, trying to repurpose that and, and embed it somewhere in my sculptural work. And I thought the brick, um, I've, I've seen homes be made um, in the Dominican Republic and the rich soil, like I said, is yellow. And I thought that's such a symbolic way to honor also all the women in my life who are kind of the uh, head of homes, all the women. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought specifically that break, the Lottie Mar and that break um, was Great. symbolic for the women in my life. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much, Stephanie. Thanks. Okay, our next artist is Gina Goiko. Um, unfortunately, Gina Goiko is unable to participate this evening because of urgent circumstances, but I believe it, is al it also happens to be her birthday. So if Gina happens to be watching right now, happy birthday, Gina. <laughs> uh, Smack Melon's curator and director of exhibitions, Gabriel de Guzman, will share images of Gina's work and will speak to her process on her behalf. Through her work, Gina Goico navigates her dual identity as an artist existing in the Dominican Republic and the United States. In the process, she has come to create a diverse body of work that ranges from collage to installation, sculpture to performance. Goico has participated in the Bronx Museum's Artists in the Marketplace, the Laundromat Project's Kelly Street Artist Residency, Bronx Art Space Summer Residency, and Red Bull House of Art Residency in Detroit. Gina Goiko is one of Smack Mellon's 2019-2020 New York Community Bent Trust Van Leer Fellows. And Gabriel, are you ready? Uh, yeah. Um, yes, ready. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Becky. Um, so, yeah, we're sorry that Gina couldn't be here today. Happy birthday. Um, but I'm very pleased to be presenting her work. I'm going to show examples from three uh, recent projects. As Gina describes her art, there, quote, there is a connecting thread through my work, weaving embroidery, mending, and color. In the variety of mediums I approach for my artwork, I dis dissect ideas of Dominicanness, womanhood, and community. So um, next slide. So this is an installation view of work from Gina's Pejisas series, which the artist sees as a form of weaving narratives. These brightly colored tapestries start as old clothes and fabric remnants that are cut and woven into a tarp in the tra tradition of pejisas or Dominican rag rugs. She uses the fabrication of these tapestries as a platform for bringing communities together to narrate hours of collaborative performance. Interactions are captured in audio and video, which next to the pejisas help decipher the narratives woven around communal labor. So at the top of this image is the view of the front of those objects. And on the bottom, you can see the back of the works along with a three channel video that shows the communal activity. Next slide. Here's an image of how the pejisas are made. Um, everyone sits around a large work table and weaves the scraps into a tarp. And then similar to a quilting bee, the work becomes not only an occasion for art making, but it's the impetus for gathering, creative placemaking, community building, and storytelling. Next. Here's an image of Gina giving an artist talk in Inwood Hill Park next to her piece, Sanar or Heal, in 2018. This project was organized by the Northern Manhattan Arts Alliance and the New York City Parks Department. The Inwood and Washington, Washington Heights neighborhoods in Northern Manhattan uh, have a large Dominican community, which Gina worked with to create this piece. Next. This is a piece from a body of work created during a three month residency at uh, Red Bull House of Arts in Detroit in 2018, in which she uh, embroidered images and text onto women's underwear. On the bright red panties in this image, she embroidered two palm leaves guarding the words Mia Sola or mine alone on the front and the long tool fabric legs have other phrases embroidered. In this case, Gina says, quote, panties become banners that highlight the expected regarding sex tourism in the Caribbean. Next. This is from the Ad Address series in which 
Gina took old clothes that were hand-me-downs from her mother. She tore them up and, and then mended different pieces together, rendering them unpractical for wearing. So instead, they became sculptural objects that she used as props and performances in which she danced and contorted herself, forcing the object to become a vessel for her body. Next. This process was captured in video and photography. Here's a video still from one of the performances. Next. The objects also became part of a multi-layered, uh, became part of multi-layered installations uh, that contain old family photographs, performance documentation, fabric, and embroidery. Next. This is um, an example from Gina's Loving Suits, a developing project that encompasses soft-weighted sculptures and multimedia documentation of D Dominican women's stories. The fabric sculptures are filled with plastic beads and plush stuffing and anointed with lavender and frankincense. The shape of hands simulates connecting limbs that can be molded into an embrace. As part of the project, she invites participants, Dominican women, to wear them, embracing their bodies and providing support while the women respond to questions about love, memory, and family. Next. So during the pandemic, she developed the project so that the interactions could happen remotely. In this new iteration, Gina conducts interviews and workshops on Zoom, teaching participants how to create a small sculpture using a sack and filling it with grains or oats, essential oils, or tea. These um, sensory sculptures are used to soothe and ease tension. The process has allowed her to connect with people all over the world. So this is a drawing of Dominican women who participated from New York and New Jersey, but also from Barcelona. Next. Gina is currently working on editing the audio recordings from the interviews and creating visuals to accompany the women's narratives. This is a video still from an animation Gina created to go along with one participant's recollection of how her father, an avid swimmer, bestowed upon her a love of water. And that was the end. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Gabriel. Um, does anyone have any questions? Gabriel will try to answer them. Rosa has a question. Okay. Hi. I read earlier in her um, um, bio and artist statement online about participatory research. And I can see how she is doing participatory collecting and working together. But can you say more about the participatory research? That seems to be like a separate category. Um, I think it, I think it's more, I think the research more involves like collecting stories um, from, especially from the Dominican women that she's working with. Um, and so she conducting these interviews um, with the women and, and also I think she's, especially with the Loving Suits um, project, she's thinking a lot about, um, uh, she's thinking a lot about like gender uh, roles in, in Dominican culture and um, specifically the role of women there and, um, and the treatment of women and expectations of women in, the Dominican Republic and I think so a lot of the interviews that she's collecting are like she's trying to learn about the experiences of, of um, women who grew up in the DR. Um, so would you say that the shared storytelling is the participatory uh, research? Yeah so it is and and in the videos I mean, we didn't play the video, but in the videos, she's actually using um, recordings of the voices of the women in the videos. So you actually hear the women speaking about um, their experiences. So it's, um, it's participatory in that way as well. And then the, the rag, the pejisas, the rag rugs, those are clearly participatory because people are sitting down at a table with her uh, with the fabrics and then weaving together and and having conversations thank you that's helpful yeah thank you so much gabriel um it's a good thing that we have someone um 
with an art history background to to fill in the oh. <laughs> fill in the gaps when we don't have the artist. Um, okay, so our next artist is Javier Maria. Javier Maria is SmackMoan's media systems manager. In addition to installing the AV for all of our exhibitions, Javier also maintains um, a studio practice and has a studio at SmackMelon. He is a New York-based Dominican artist whose work is focused primarily whose work is focused on mental health, institutionalization, and bureaucracy. He uses poetry, online forms, photography, and video through the lens of science fiction to generate new narratives as a tool to visualize new futures and associations. He graduated as a graphic and digital designer from the Altos de Chavon School of Design in 2011. His work has been exhibited at Central Leon Biennial, the Wrong Biennial, the Image Center, Altos de Chavon Gallery, Casa Quien, and the Noma Gallery. I'm going to stop screen sharing and actually Javier is going to screen share because most of his work is web-based. Great. Thank you, Becky, and thank you, everybody in SmackMoland. OK, can everybody see the screen? Perfect. I've been working with mental health and how inequality plays a fundamental role in the development of new treatments. My main focus has been the clinical trials in which some community members need to participate in exchange for free care. I am particularly interested in the process of recruitment and the implications of these studies. This first piece is a blockout of the 19-page consent form contract provided by one psychiatric institution in New York City, where I participated a few years ago when I arrived to the country as an immigrant. In this piece, I highlight some of the specific physical and privacy implications of the clinical study. I'm going to scroll all the way down. I've been also interested in how standardized impersonal is the language of health ads used to recruit these subjects. This second piece called Low Mod Study is based on a series of online ads you can find under jobs or services on pages like Craigslist. You can select any option from the drop down menu list. The result will be a ready to post ad. Here, these are images of these centers. They are all around the United States. Um, in the research that I did on Craigslist, I found on, on a national level more than 70. Um, they are normally focusing on low income people. This is the project that I'm working on right now. Um, this is a mock-up of how I see the piece being presented. We, this is um, part of the investigation I've been gathering. Um, the idea is to project this piece in the space and let the user navigate the forms all simultaneously um, with the use of trackpads. Emma is a fictional character that is being exposed to a treatment known as heliotherapy. 
where they are exposed to light devices to overcome psychiatric conditions such as depression disorder, bipolar disorder, and postpartum depression. This work is part of an investigation about programmable light devices in minority communities, specifically in Washington Heights and the Bronx. These are the few images I've been taking with this character. Bloque is a series of enlightenment emulators. They are prog programmable light devices that recreates the behavior and rhythm of LED modules found around the display windows in bodegas and other commerce around the neighborhood. This sculpture is a brick size model representing the buildings in the corner of the blocks where informal business and police presence is common. This place is a series of poems called LSHR, La Colonia Bolerica. They are programmed and displaying an LED sign. This work is about my immigrant experience in Washington Heights and was an exercise about the possibility of these commercial devices to be used as a storytelling tool, as a resistance of the neighborhood that is being um, highly gentrified. Here you can see. <laughs> Portal is a interactive sculpture made of plastic beads forming a revolving pattern inspired in LED signs where the word power is being deconstructed. The sculpture hangs from the ceiling and allows one person inside creating this kind of place, playful experience, but also isolate the user in the space. This piece was presented in a museum in the Dominican Republic, a country where bead curtains are often used in rural houses as a way to separate spaces. I think that's time, Becky. Great, thank you so much, Javier. All right. Um, questions? Gabriel has a question. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, because your work is looking at um, the way that um, technology sort of affects us, um, I wonder if you've, if you've done any research or looked at any research about um, how digital media, um, whether it's like websites or social media, like how it affects us psychologically. Have you re have you read about that, or and does that inform your work in any way? Um, I was actually very interested in the topic, and um, I am uh, a strong user of social media and a strong advocate for it. Um, I think that this dialogue that we are so attached to our devices that we are losing this human sense. It's a normal process that has happened all across the media, across history. Um, that same thing was put when TVs came out, for example. Um, so I don't actually relate it to, the, to my work, to be honest. Okay, interesting. Thanks. Hanika said, uh, asks, what is being done with the data collected from your work from the forms that are filled out online? That is a great question. Um, I've been collecting data and I have this site up before. Um, I took them down because of the cost of them and the pandemic, but I've been collecting all the data and I'm not sure what I'm gonna do with it. Um, I think it's interesting because I'm not providing in the web page any kind of um, any kind of waiver or information about what is going to be do with the data and people when they get in they still fill it out. So 
thank you for that question. Great. And also, Judith has a question. First of all, sorry, I hit caps lock, so I'm not screaming at anyone. Um, Yes, I find them really interesting, and especially when the philosophy itself turns into something electronic. I'm wondering, because they were all still images, do you have an emotion involved in the electronics themselves, almost so digitally moving? Uh, uh, because I think that could be an interesting component, like when you said that power was sort of disintegrating in that, too, if that was done almost... Uh, you know, like a movie and a flash that could be really interesting. Thank you. Um, I'm actually interested in keeping everything very like, I don't like how bureaucracy work that is very gray and it's very numb. And I'm interested in using um, digital devices or digital experiences that are very dry and actually that are very boring because I think that the experience of navigating mental health in the United States and navigating the mental health structure, like all the, 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 the things that you need to follow to be able to get the help, it's a bureaucratic process that do not have that. And it's very important for my work to keep it as dry as possible. Have you spoken with uh, or consulted with uh, social clinical social workers, psychiatrists, uh, uh, social workers, any any of those? Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm actually very um, used to deal with that across, and I I have deal with mental health in the United States and in the Dominican Republic as well. I'm actually interested more in, and I have a therapist that I go to. I mean, I'm, I'm more interested in the, in the kind of doing research about the process of navigating these spaces here. Cool, all right. Thanks so much, Javier. Um, so, um, oh, I'm gonna stop share. Are you still in, oh, you, oh you're not in stop share anymore. <laughs> um, great. So thank you all. Thank you to all our studio artists for sharing your work this evening. Um, I'll just name them again. Camel Collective, Rochelle Dang, Jess Fan, Chantal Fetosa, Stephanie Hermosin, Gina Goico, and Javier Maria. Um, we really appreciate you sharing your work with, with the community. Um, and also, I'd like to remind everybody that tonight's program is a part of Dumbo Open Studios. Um, there will be other virtual open studio events throughout July. Um, so do go on DumboOpenStudios.com um, for more information if you want to attend other open studios events online. Um, also, next week on Thursday at 6 p.m., we'll host our final five max artist presentations. Um, you can find out more about 5Max on our website at smackmelon.org. We hope to see you next week and have a good night. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank you, Audrey. Thanks, Becky. Thanks, artists. Thank you, everybody, for joining Thanks, us. Thanks, everybody. Okay, I'm gonna end the meeting. Okay. <laughs> I was like, I don't want to end it. Like the trickle down, the trickle. Great. Okay, bye guys. Bye. bye.